Welcome to Lockbox, a podcast providing real estate professionals with action items for success. My name is Jeffrey Broger, and I'm going to be your host. I'm the founder of two real estate marketing and tech companies, Steezy.Digital and RealNurture.io. In this podcast, you'll learn from top 1% real estate and mortgage brokers the exact secrets to their success. Welcome to Lockbox. Welcome to Lockbox. My name is Jeffrey Broger, and with me today is Mr. Max Fish. Max, thanks for being on. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, why don't you first just tell our listeners who you are, where you're from? Yeah, so I'm originally from New Jersey, uh, based out of uh, the Philadelphia market currently, and uh, I'm a, a full-time uh, real estate investor. We do some wholesale and some rehab, and also have a uh, virtual assistant agency as well. Excellent. Yeah, we'll definitely talk a lot about that. I am curious to start it off though, what got you into real estate? So I started in the early 2000s. Actually, uh, a friend of mine had opened up a uh, mortgage brokerage. And at the time I was in college and he, he basically you know, wore me down, asked me over and over and over if I'd come work for him. And uh, he had a pretty small organization, but uh, him and the handful of guys there. And I finally caved and started in the mortgage business. And you know, one thing led to another, and I bought my first um, rehab property within you know, I don't know, eighteen months or something like that. And basically, uh, plugging away, and you know, here we are today. Nice. So, buddy wrangled you into it, started on the finance side and mortgage, and then uh, here you are today, doing rehabs, investing in houses. So, I'm curious, you know. This podcast is all about action items. You know, what are the action items that lead to success? So as a real estate investor, you know, you're doing significant volume. Uh, we talked a little bit about the podcast here. You know, you're doing about three, four deals a month, you know, six, maybe 12 rehabs a year. So with that being said, what's the single most important action that you take every day that attributes most to your success? That's a good question. Yeah. So my business is definitely a lower volume kind of operation, uh, which is the way that I want it. And I'm also, I don't want to say I'm spread thin, but I'm spread ac across a couple of different businesses. So, you know, honestly, I just, I would say fundamentals, um, just being consistent. You know, we have our, our systems and processes in place and just being consistent, you know, getting up every day and, and, you know, following through, you know, whether it's marketing or closing, training, whatever it is that we're, you know, we're focused on, you know, whatever I'm focused on for that day, I kind of break my week up. So yeah, I would say staying consistent. And then my father always told me the only thing that you can control is your attitude. So I would say, uh, mm. I'd say a positive attitude and consistency. Cool. Yeah. Consistency is the biggest thing when it comes to pretty much any type of business. I, I first experienced that when I was a direct sales rep for Cutco Cutlery and my managers told me, hey, you want momentum to be on your side. If you put all this energy in to build it up and then you just fall off for a month because you got a big commission check, you got to put all that energy in again to build it up because you just let it all fall down. So that consistency every day rather than making 100 phone calls a day or even more, if you just made 20 phone calls but you did it longer and you, you, know, you did that for a year, well, that consistency over time is going to multiply and ramp up. So huge point there. Really appreciate you bringing that up. I want to learn more about the VA system that you have. So with VAs, what does that mean? What is a VA? Yeah. So a VA, simply put, is a virtual assistant, virtual professional outsourcing. You know, these are all terms that are associated with that, that idea. But basically, and it's kind of funny now with the pandemic, uh, this has become pretty mainstream, I guess I'd say. But, uh, you know, simply put, it's the idea of hiring someone to do a task, a set of tasks, or even take on a full-time position in a remote capacity. You know, that's simply put, that's all it is. Yeah, that makes sense. And so when it comes to investing, wholesaling, you know, with real estate, what are you having your VAs do? Yeah. So like I said, from the beginning, um, I have a, an agency. Essentially, we develop systems of hiring, training, and managing these VAs. Friends were asking you know, pretty frequently, you know, how do you do this? How do you make it work? Because everybody has the same set of issues or same set of hurdles. And I ultimately agreed to help somebody. I told them I had to charge them, you know, obviously for, for my time. And um, that 
I would say is one of the major reasons why my business has has grown the way it is and also why I have the flexibility that I do. The real estate business is traditionally a low tech, very hands-on kind of business. And so being able to outsource uh, as much as I have has allowed me to, you know, focus on other things, spend my spend my time in different areas, you know, hobbies, other business interests, things like that. So our VAs do almost everything at some level in the business, at some point in the process. And, uh, you know, honestly, with good training and management, you know, a VA is no different than hiring someone and having them sit in your office next to you, uh, you know, we're looking yeah. over your shoulder. Interesting. And I'm glad that you elaborated on that, told the story of how you got into it. Now you have an agency that helps real estate professionals with the VA onboarding and training process, right? Of getting them set that's up correct. and get, getting them mm-hmm. hired and, and how to structure it all. Because I think that's a big hurdle. It's like, okay, I've heard about VAs, but I don't really know like what to do, how to do it, where to find them, or they've tried it in the past. And like you mentioned, with the right training and management, they can be super effective. But without that, they're set up for failure. And that was a big thing that I learned from Tim Ferriss. I read the four hour work week years ago, I mean, probably a decade ago. And he talked about virtual assistants, and he actually coached you in the book through how to best leverage a virtual assistant. And I've still used that framework today. So do you want to tell us some best practices for when you do hire either, you know, your agency or, or, you know, you go hire a VA, um, what are you doing to train and onboard the VAs and set them up for success? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've developed a, an entire process, you know, st- kind of starting from the beginning. We have something like 70 different sites, you know, that we use to to attract talent. Right? So think of it, generally speaking, the process is no different than hiring a traditional employee. You know, you might advertise on Indeed or you know, maybe one of these gig type sites, depending on what the job entails. Same idea here. So because we are sourcing people globally, we're using, like I said, maybe 70 different sites. Okay. We think of a funnel, we bring them into the top of the funnel, and then we have different processes, uh, disc profile, personality profile tests, and things that we use to try to really identify the folks that we want, because we're not Hiring so much a, a resume as a personality because it takes a certain kind of person to, you know, work from home, not unmanaged, but kind of independently. Uh, so we're looking for certain personalities, and then from there, it took about maybe about a year or two. We developed a whole training program, and that can be anything from, you know, basic how to use Zoom, how we want the phones answered, what whatever the again whatever the task or the job entails, all the way down to something very detailed. So. Uh, a good portion of our business right now, especially on the real estate side, is lead gen, right? So there's specific tools and processes that they have to use or that they have to go through. And so we'll take it, we'll kind of niche it down and, and really talk specifically about that kind of stuff. And as far as the management goes, we're using, um, you know, different systems to ensure that, you know, that they're actually working, that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. I think the biggest hurdles that a lot of guys see is, you know, they hear the idea of hiring someone, giving them all of, you know, their entire workload, and then they can go sit on a beach, right? You know, that's probably every, you know, video uh, sales letter, every offer out there. But in reality, you know, hire uh, somebody off the street for 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour and leave them in your office unattended and see what happens. It'd be the same idea. And so, I think that's where a lot of people get hung up is that they have this really great idea, but then, you know, how do you implement it and how do you ensure that the tasks that you want done actually get done, right? How do you handle the management piece? So we've kind of stepped in to fill a void in the sense that everybody understands what a VA is, everybody sees a need, but nobody really knows how to put into practice, again, the hiring, training, and management. So that's what your agency offers. Long story short, yes. People pay us a premium to do what they can't do or don't want to do themselves, which is hire, sounds, train, and manage. And and we sounds can awesome. Yeah, we can offer the whole thing or we can break it up. If somebody just wanted us to identify a few folks and they kind of want to train them themselves, we can do that. If they want us to handle the training and management, they can do that. If someone has VAs now and they really like them, but they just they just can't manage them, you know, we for a fee can handle the management aspect as well. Yes. And I like how you touched on the dream. The dream is you 
build this business, in this case, real estate, you hire a team, and then you get to just leave and be gone. And whether that team is comprised of domestic or international uh, team members, that's kind of the dream, uh, right? And I know a lot of my my top 1% real estate broker clients, the real estate mortgage clients, they're getting ready to retire. They're in their 50s, 55. And you know they want to be laying on a beach in the Caribbean. They want to have a boat. They want to you know just kind of cash out and and stop the sure. grind. And so that's the dream. And with that, there's the fallacy of like you still need to lead and guide the team. So unless you hire you know like a right hand, train, develop him or her, and then leave them behind to do that for you. If it's not getting done, it's not getting done. So the alternative to that is you know, Max's agency, really interesting offer. They can help to train, develop the VAs to operate at the highest level and actually hold them accountable and get things done the, at the standard that you want them done. Because I can tell you, you know, being a digital marketing agency myself, I use multiple VAs, I have multiple businesses, and it is work to manage them. It still is work. So, you know, that's if you want to even go one further removed from the day to day. You need the VA, but then you need a manager for the VA, right? So or process to manage them. Yep. Right, right. So I'm curious, you know, with the industry heading so far into the tech realm, you know, with a lot of the companies out there that are becoming brokerages, you know, they're a marketplace, but now they're a broker and, you know, they're offering loan services and Amazon partnering with Realogy. And like, there's so many, there's so much happening right now in the real estate industry. So many companies come, trying to come in and disrupt. Where do you think the industry's headed? What are your five, 10 year projections? Well, that's an interesting question. So speaking specifically to the sector that I'm involved in, which is single family residential, you know, I think there's a lot of question marks out there. I think the political environment and the money that's being spent, I think is going to be very good in the short term, medium and long term, who knows? Specifically, I'm talking about interest rates and inflation and things like that. I think that there's going to almost certainly be more regulation. I think that affordability is going to be a huge problem going forward. So those folks that are looking at affordable housing development or uh, mobile home parks or you know things like that, where there's a you know lower costs, I think those are great you know areas for uh, for opportunity. And although there's a lot of technology to kind of help with things like valuation, you know, maybe, you know, running your numbers or accounting, different things like that. At the end of the day, especially with rehabs, you you still have to send people to work with their hands on the physical property. So that's not going to change too much Uh, with regard to the way that we sell the houses and and things like that. I think that's going to change. You know, there's a lot of potential disruption. You know, you have the old traditional list the house with a real estate agent model. And I don't think that's going to go away, but I think there's going to be a lot of disruptive forces there. And, you know, the way that we're raising money, for example, that is, has changed with technology. That's become incredibly uh, more simplistic and, and you know, there's way more money out there. So that's uh, interesting. I think a lot more entrance into the market, a lot of new investors going to come in, um, which we've basically seen over the last five years. And that's just due to, you know, access to information and technology. People recognize uh, an opportunity to, to make money. So, so that's, uh, so I think there's going to be a lot more buyers, a lot more players and things like that. But I would say in general, um, you know, things are, you know, the outlook is good in my opinion. There's an article literally just out, I think yesterday or the day before in the Wall Street Journal that said, I'm going to paraphrase, basically we're short, I think, 4 million units nationally. And basically it all boils down to 2008. And the banks essentially stopped lending to the small developers. And so for you know roughly 10 years, we had almost new housing stock, no new construction, but the population growth continued. And so, yep. you know, we're seriously behind the eight ball now. And so, you know, just basic economics, supply and demand. You know, there's a lot of demand and no supply. So until the interest rates really, you know, get back to that, you know, six percent or or you know, heck, even double digits, something crazy because of inflation. I don't see any real slowdown or any real pressure. I think the issue for guys like me is still going to be, you know, how do we find the properties? And uh, that kind of all goes back to the, 
yeah, it all kind of goes back to lead generation and all that's really, yeah. it's very easy to sell deals right now. It's very hard to find good deals. And so I think right. that's going to continue to be the problem for a long time. Yeah. Thanks for that outlook. You dropped a lot of interesting insights and some, some data as well that supports and backs up your insights. I am curious, you know, I own a digital marketing agency. We focus specifically on branding, advertising, and consulting for top 1% real estate brokers and mortgage brokers. And what does that mean? Lead gen. <laughs> that means we're generating buyer leads, seller leads, and helping them recruit agents to their team. So my question to you is, you know, how are you sourcing deals right now? So for us, I um, my agency grew again out of my own kind of efforts and people seeing uh, me having success. So I currently have five cold callers in my own business. And I mentioned a little bit about my volume. My volume is not terribly large, but you, you know, you got to make a lot of phone calls to generate deals in this environment. So, so I have five callers and then I have another three VAs in my business that do all the administrative stuff. And in my office, there's only four of us. There's myself, project manager, acquisitions manager, and dispositions manager. VA support all of those roles. And, um, you know, I purposely run, you know, what I would call a lean operation. You know, I try to keep my costs down. I uh, recently moved my office and was actually able to reduce my rental expense, eh, partly because of COVID, but I really am I'm big on trying to keep costs down. So as I said, lead gen is, is, um, is uh, cold calling about 90% of the business. And then the other 10% is direct mail. So we'll do direct mail for those specialty lists like probate or something like that, where we don't feel as comfortable reaching out to the people or, or maybe the contact is, a, is an attorney, you know, someone who is probably not going to engage with us um, over the telephone like that, and then follow up. Uh, we use direct mail for follow up as well. So I went down the Facebook ads PPC route. That was an incredible failure and mm. uh, a painful lesson financially. And then I've, I've tried, we were doing door knocking and things like that um, years ago. That's much more difficult now. And uh, texting, the, the laws changed last year. So there's, you know, all these disclosures and opt out and stuff you have to do. So that is not having the same success. And then referrals. We pushed pretty hard for referrals, whether it's previous client referrals, real estate agent referrals. That's probably more on the, on the rehab side. But we've had our success dealing primarily with homeowners directly and sellers directly. Yeah. And do a lot of cold calling. You mentioned the failure of Facebook and, and uh, Google PPC, and I'd love to dive into that a little bit more. So did you mm -hmm. have an agency run that for you? Were you trying to learn it yourself? You know, can you tell the story of, of kind of what happened with that? Yeah, no, I didn't have an agency doing it. And I think quite honestly, I mean, I'm one of those people that I'm, if I make a mistake, I'm happy to you know, raise my hand and, and acknowledge that and, and try to learn from it. So I blame myself. I think that the lack of agency and the lack of mentorship or guidance or whatever you want to call it uh, is probably the main reason. I basically, uh, myself and one of my VAs kind of jumped into it. I tried to teach myself and I kind of waded into a unknown water, right? Into unknown territory. I I really should have either hired someone to, you know, who had the knowledge and experience that I didn't have to do it for me, or at least, you know, give me some type of guidance or mentorship. Because basically I just jumped in figuring out oh, if you spend money, it'll, you know, it'll work itself out. And, you know, obviously that, that was not the case. And it, you know, it's just something that's really complicated. I don't have a lot of experience. It's not something that I'm very passionate about. So I never really focused on it. And, you know, for me, I think it's, it's a good lesson in the sense that you should, um, you know, you should focus on what your core competencies are, right? That is not one of mine. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And I have heard that more times than you might think I've heard on strategy calls with clients. Hey, I've been burned before. I've been burned by a agency in the past that, you know, charged me $5,000 and didn't even deliver a product or didn't even offer the service. Like I've been, you know, I've had someone run ads for me for three months, had nothing right and so i've heard all the different horror stories you know trying to learn it yourself and it takes thousands of hours and i've invested in so many masterminds paid masterminds i've taken the facebook blueprint like it took so long i studied copywriting to finally get it to the point where i put an ad out there and people sign up for it and like generate sleeves <laughs> like it took so long and it was so painful but yeah that's that's why you know that experience just helps and i i naturally have a marketing and kind of innovative type of mind and i love technology so you know that stuff resonated with me i was able to 
grit my teeth and get past the initial hurdles and failures and mistakes. And uh, that's, we're a digital marketing agency. So it was, you know, when I heard that, I was like, huh, I want to dive into that deeper because, you know, when you have the agency, it's kind of like the VA thing. Like if you go, you know, you go on Upwork, you find a VA, you hire them, and then you just like, okay, bye. They're not going to be successful. And so it's like that wasn't set up for success. But when you hire, you know, Max as an agency that does this every day, they're going to be successful, right? And it's just like the real estate. You talk about a FISBO. You know, someone's like, yeah, I'm going to sell my home myself. I'm going to save the commission. And then they start to get into it and they're researching things on YouTube and they see how much goes into the deal. And they're like, holy crap, right? And that's where the real estate agent comes in to offer that agency representation. And so, yeah, it's really interesting. You know, nowadays, I'm not only a real estate agent and have studied the fiduciary responsibility of the real estate agent to the client, but I also feel that fiduciary responsibility for my digital marketing agency to my client. Like I need to do what's in their highest and best interest. And uh, <laughs> I hear those horror stories all the time. So you're not alone. And if cold calling and everything works for you, I love how you talked about how my business volume is small and I like it that way. Because I'm actually the same with my agency. I have my clientele roster small because they're top 1%. They pay well and they get great results. But you know, my goal isn't to scale this to a $2 billion firm right? It's, I'm an entrepreneur. This is one of my businesses. It's supporting an amazing lifestyle. I've been able to travel the world and live an incredible life because I invested time and energy in the right business model to where I could be anywhere in the world. I I thought critically about it before I invested a lot of the time into it. And so I kept mine, you know, relatively small and it it still grows organically, but I love how you said that, you know, you said it's, you know, my firm's relatively small, the, the wholesale, the flipping, but I like it that way. And that's awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I don't know, some lifestyle, a cool story of sitting on the beach and uh, your VAs are actually doing what you want them to do and it's it's all working out? Sure. Yeah. So before I do that, if I may, there's one thing I want to add to the marketing aspect. I think that your listeners yeah. will appreciate this. So you made an excellent point and the agency business is exactly what got me to think about the Facebook ads and PPC in the way that you just mentioned. It's what has caused me to be willing to engage that, you know, agent to list my property or, you know, like we, we use agents, outside agents. And one of my, the guys on my team is a licensed agent. So it doesn't make sense to save the money because he's not doing the retail agent business every day. It's best to find someone, you know, you specialize in digital marketing. You know, I do not. So I would hire you. My, what I was going to say though, is, um, what pushed me in that direction and why I really should focus on is because I break the market down into kind of three segments from a marketing perspective. You have those folks who are probably older, who probably have a cell phone, but don't use it. They certainly don't carry it around all the time. And they're the folks that are going to typically respond to direct mail. Okay. You have the guys in the middle, which are probably more like you and I, you know, middle-aged who are not, maybe not the direct mail focus, but probably not the online focus either. And we'll typically respond to text and phone calls. And then you have that typically younger generation who's online only, who probably gets one piece of mail to their their residents every two months and probably never answers the phone, screens all their calls, but would definitely engage with a Facebook ad or something like that. And so I kind of have those first two covered, but not that third. And going back to the Wall Street Journal, there was another article talking about how millennials are now entering the market. And that's one of the biggest buying segments next to, or buying or selling next to the baby boomers, right? So it is foolish of me to just say, hey, it didn't work and stay away from it because it's such a big piece of the market. So I I just wanted to add that because I I think that um, it's helpful to consider the recipient of the message when you're marketing, whatever method that is. Yeah. So- my anyway, first so getting, step in a campaign. Yeah, uh, real quick, exactly. Uh, to go further, <clears throat> my first step in a campaign is platform. Who is your target for this campaign, and where are they getting their news? Where are their eyeballs? Where are their ears? Right? How do we get in front of them? Yep. Because we could have the perfectly crafted message, and if they don't hear it or see it, it's not going to have any impact. Doesn't even so matter. I'm yeah. big on that. I'm big on demographics. Where are they? Platform, even hyper local. I'll go to like hyper niche local and ask the the top broker, this is my new client, like, where are these people getting their news? It's not always just throw a Facebook ad up, 
you know, sometimes we get really creative and do other things and it has more success because I get that feedback from them. So yes, great consultative approach. Yeah. Oh, of course. Always. Yeah. So getting back to your last question about, you know, the dream, I mean, I think for me, I travel, but I'm certainly, I have a lot more traveling to do, right? I'm looking forward more than looking back. And um, I certainly haven't traveled the world or anything like that uh, yet. For me, so again, I'm out of the Philadelphia market and where where we're located, the Jersey Shore and the Atlantic Ocean is a, is a big thing. And so, so I have a house down at the shore and having the VAs and, and having a, a good portion of my business outsourced affords me the ability to go back and forth. So for example, in the summertime when it's real hot and, and humid and sticky in the city and nobody really wants to be there, you know, I can maybe spend five days a week down at the shore Again, real estate's low tech, so you can't separate yourself 100%, but I can spend the majority of my time there rather than being in the city, right? So very much like your business, I'm not chained to my desk. I'm not tethered to to any one location per se, which I like. I like being able to have some flexibility in my day and and know that just because I'm not at that, say like a retail location or something that, that I can't do business. I'd say for me, that that's one of the things that I really like, that kind of flexibility. I remember uh, kind of back in the day, you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago when, when people were just starting to get really serious about selling things on the internet, you'd hear all these stories of, you know, guys working out of coffee shops and stuff like that. And although I'm not one of those, I mean, I guess I could do that. As long as I have my laptop and my phone, I can kind of take my business wherever I want, which I like. So, uh, you know, so for me, that's the dream, that kind of flexibility. And now with virtual wholesaling and this big push for virtual, plus the technology, the phone technology and things like that, you certainly can. I mean, I, I have clients that, whose business is 100% virtual. And if they didn't tell me, I'd have no idea where in the world they are because where they do business is not where they live or work. And so, yeah. So for me, I'd say it's that flexibility to not be tied to any one place. You know, I do have an office. I do go there. But, you know, this time of year, it's really nice outside. I mean, I'm, I don't know, I'm in the office maybe two or three days a week. And then I'm in the field and, you know, trying to mix things up and, you know, and enjoy the, you know, enjoy the outdoors, but, you know, keep it. What I don't want is I don't want to be monotonous. You know, I want it, I want to kind of mix it up and, and keep things fresh. And then of course there's clients and other folks that I go and meet in person. I have clients, you know, that are say within an hour's drive or two hours drive of me. And I've in the past, I've gone to their office and spent time with them and their market and things like that, which I also enjoy. So, so I'd say for me, the dream isn't, you know, sitting on the beach, having the VAs do everything. Like I said, it's, it's not really possible, but, but more just the flexibility and that kind of freedom to, to move around if I, if I want, you know, real estate is a great business. If you have the tenacity, if you have the commitment, the consistency, if you have those attributes, then if you can kind of struggle and suffer through those first, you know, the first year or two or whatever it takes for you to get that momentum, uh, like you talked about, you know, you can have a, have a really good, uh, you know, really fulfilling career and, and lifestyle with real estate. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners have experienced the, the wealth of that, the, you know, gone through that process, built teams, and they're getting to that point where I think a lot of them are starting to think more about leverage and freeing up their time. And so, Absolutely. you know, what you just depicted, the ability to, you know, not 100% just leave and be on the other side of the world necessarily, but the ability to be, like you mentioned, at your Jersey Shore house five days a week, if you want to, that freedom is super powerful. And, uh, you know, you're, you setting up the systems that you currently have has afforded you that. So love that. That's great. I'm curious, what's a failure or an apparent failure that has set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? Favorite failure? I do. So about, so I always got to add a year to everything with, uh, you know, with COVID, I always, I always get mixed up. So I guess it's been two and a half years, maybe almost three years now. So I was really excited about the idea of pushing tasks off to other people, not outsourcing. I mean, outsourcing, but you'll understand in a second. So I thought it would be great instead of dealing with all the contractors myself to hire a project manager. And I rushed the process. Hmm. I didn't vet him the way I should have. I didn't spend as much time training him as I should have. I didn't spend nearly enough time managing him as I should have. And 
I'll spare you all the wonderful details, but to make a long story short, he ended up misrepresenting my company, getting kickbacks from contractors, paying some, not paying others, losing checks, sending materials in different places. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But in the end, I think I figured it out between the little bit he was actually able to steal, which is very difficult, and everything else. He probably cost he probably cost me about $100,000 that year. Wow. And when I, I remember it like it was yesterday, when I finally terminated him, he refused to give back the laptop that I'd given him for work and demanded, tried to demand his last paycheck when he hadn't actually worked for, because I paid everybody every two weeks, he hadn't maybe worked for a month. And he came into the office and started yelling at me as if I had done something wrong. And I just remember looking back at that, thinking to myself, like, you have to be a really, it takes a, a certain a certain kind of person to act that malicious, right? To steal from somebody and negatively impact their business and then be that arrogant that you're you're not going to return company property and, and all this stuff and look at the person as if they've done something wrong when in fact, you're the one who did something wrong. And so, so my lesson there and my lesson to all of your listeners and viewers would be, I have since made it a focus to be very cautious about who I hire, what tasks I give them, and then how I manage them. And that's why the agency business is, you know, I always say hire, train, and manage. It's not healthy to wear all the hats, but it's difficult to like hand the reins to somebody or even give them a portion of the responsibilities, but it's necessary to grow. However, you have to be very, very careful about who you choose and how you do it. Because if you do what I did, I mean, it took probably a year to straighten out all these projects that ended up over budget, you know, significantly delayed, all of that. Uh, and then shortly after that, Corona hits. So it was like, bam, bam for us. And um, I don't know if you know it, but I, to my understanding, Pennsylvania and New Jersey were the only two states that shut down residential construction for six months or so. So last year was a, you know, was a pretty interesting year for us. Things are great now. I mean, the market, you know, obviously everyone knows where the market is, but that, yeah, that would be my favorite mistake, as you put it. Hire slow, fire fast. Correct. Spend more time on training than you think you need to. <laughs> There's no such thing as too much training. And yeah. I tell my team all the time, we all can always improve. And that includes myself. Absolutely. And got to lead by example in that, which uh, I know a lot of my clients, it's it's like you only achieve the top 1% of real estate if you're doing these things. If you have a great mindset, if you're consistent, you know, if you're a, you know, a good people person, you have, you know, ethics and, you know, you actually care about others and, you know, you're not, you can't screw people over and get to the top. It just doesn't work. And so well, yeah, you I, have to do everything for the right reasons. I agree right. totally. Yeah. And there's all these, you know, adages, you know, you make, you attract more bees with honey than with vinegar and all, all that kind of stuff. You're hundred percent right. And, and, you know, I think it's, it's kind of become a little cliche, I guess, but the, uh, you know, helping others or solving problems or, you know, the more problems you solve, the more successful you'll be, you know, all that kind of stuff that, you know, some of these uh, influencers or thought leaders or whatever say is true. But yeah, you, you got to be, to be truly successful, you have to be, you know, innovative and you have to be doing good work. You might be able to make some serious headway, you know, doing the wrong thing and being unethical and, and stealing from people. But, but in the end, yeah, it's going to catch up to you. And, and, and that's Always not does. a, it's not a long-term recipe for success. That's, um, you right. know, so, and it's a shame. I mean, this, the gentleman I'm speaking of, unfortunately, you know, he had some kind of issue. I, I don't know if he committed suicide or you know, something happened to him, but it's just an unfortunate situation all around. So I was negatively impacted, you know, my business, my family, him, his family, and all for what, you know, because you ran over your head or because you needed a few extra bucks. I mean, I had such a great relationship with that guy. If he'd asked me to borrow some money, I would happily give it to him. Right. Happily, You know, so I think, got to keep things in perspective and re remember why we're all here, right? Real estate's great, but at the end of the day, if you really want to boil it down, it's just a job. It's just a means to an end. And so um, it's great to be passionate, but you know, you can't let it consume you either. So, yeah. And speaking of why are we here, you know, priority list number one thing for me nowadays is family. 
you know, I'm trying to spend as much time with family as possible, set my family and future generations up for success, right? And uh, do that by my actions every day, but not get lost in being a workaholic so that I never see my family now. And I think that's a really big key. I have to say no to a lot and it's hard. So, you know, what's your process for evaluating uh, what to say no to? Well, so for me, there was a time where I used to work a lot of hours, extended hours, six days a week, seven days a week even. So for me, you know, I've really tried to make it a point to have some balance. I think it's extremely important to have interests outside uh, outside of your profession or outside of work. You can and should be really excited about and really passionate about what you do for a living, but you also have to be really passionate about other things. And that could be, you know, building birdhouses. That could be, you know, some type of sport, you know, like a skiing or a snowboarding. It could be motorcycles. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's thousands and thousands of things that you could do to occupy your time in a positive way nowadays. You got to have some, and you can have multiple, right? You could be a, a sports fan and a gym guy or, you know, what, like, as I said, you can't allow it to consume you. Right. You can't, if you're in my business, you can't be real estate a hundred percent of the time, all the time, you know, you need some other interests. And then to your point, you know, then you also have family, you know, maybe married and kids or, or, you know, for the younger guys, maybe it's a, a boyfriend or, or, or girlfriend, younger gals. So there's that aspect too. Right. So, you know, I kind of think about it like buckets. So, you know, you got your work bucket. I try to limit my time now to, um, to eight, maybe nine hours a day, five days a week. And then from there, you know, for me, my weekends with very few exceptions are mine. And, uh, you know, I try to be home for dinner every night. And, you know, to answer your question, I think I've put in place some very basic boundaries and I try to limit my screen time and I, you know, try to make it a point to do some type of healthy activity uh, every day as well. So, you know, just trying to be, you know, kind of well-rounded. I enjoy the gym. That unfortunately has been a little bit of a challenge here in, uh, you know, in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. But I also recognize I'm never going to be, uh, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger and win awards either, right? So, you know, that's just one of the things I enjoy doing. I enjoy boating and the outdoors, you know. So, so but, but having that balance and having some variety, I think, is really healthy. Yeah. So your process for saying no is, is you know, you set up this system which is based on some some clear boundaries, simple but clear. And, you know, if something violates that system that you have committed to and, and you've set these boundaries, if it's outside of those boundaries, you say no. Exactly. Yeah. So, for example, I had a gentleman who wanted my help and he said, hey, I'm free at 6.30. And this was yesterday. I'm free at 6.30 p.m. And I said, look, unfortunately, that's not going to work for me. I'm available tomorrow at 9 a.m. So before you and I spoke, uh, here, I was on the phone with this gentleman this morning. I gave him an hour of my time. I had a seller who, for whatever reason, just could not work with my acquisitions manager. And uh, he'd been referred to me, he wanted to work with me directly. Fine, uh, I'll do that for you. He refused to meet any day except Saturday afternoon. And I ultimately just said, listen, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm happy to meet with you Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. You choose the time but I'm not going to work. I'm not going to meet with you on Saturday. I'm just, I, you know, because here's the thing you do it once and then you justify it and then you do it again. And before you know it, you're working every Saturday. And you know what? The guy ended up meeting with me like on a, like on a Wednesday or something, you know? So in the end it it worked out. Um, I said, look, I'll let you choose the day and time. So long as it's not Saturday and Sunday. And yeah, that wasn't unreasonable and he went for it. So, you know, I think it is important to hold fast, especially when you're, you know, as you get older, right? When you're young and you don't have a whole lot of responsibilities, family, things like that, you know, you can afford to, you know, when I was in the mortgage business, every Saturday, man, I was out doing my marketing, speaking to real estate agents. It was the best day to do it. Nobody else did it. It didn't matter. So, you know, but when you get older, I think you're right. There definitely has to be, you have commitments outside of work and you you have to be respectful of those commitments. Right. And to the residential real estate agents out there, brokers, I know a lot of you work weekends, you got to do you know whatever you got to do, listing appointments, open houses. But I think the clear takeaway here is set those boundaries and you know boundaries are so easily blurred. And then, you know, I love what you said about you do it once and all of a sudden you do it every single Saturday. So having systems in place or boundaries to where you have clarity on what to say no to. And it's like you said, both of those people that you said no to then adjusted 
to your schedule because what you allow will continue. So if you Absolutely. don't allow that, if you don't allow someone to book at 6.30 at night, well, they have to then change to accommodate your schedule. And you weren't unreasonable with the guy on Saturday. He said, any day but Saturday and Sunday, man, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And so that, you know, that you could still do business and, you know, be cordial to people. But uh, I love that, you know, having that clarity. It seems simple and it is simple, honestly, but it's it's hard to do. And And I know that a lot of real estate professionals, they are attracted to it because of the lifestyle. I can wake up whenever I want. I can, you know, not work Monday through Friday, nine to five. Uh, who wants to do that? Right. But then you start working every weekend and holidays and you work retail hours for a couple of years and you're like, man, I hate this. <laughs> and and all of a sudden, if you have no boundaries, you're working seven days a week. So I, I really do think that's a, a, a very important point. And I appreciate you sharing it. Yeah, of course. So, you know, is there a question that I should have asked you or, you know, anything you'd like to elaborate on from earlier? Not that I can think of. You know, I really enjoyed uh, talking about the real estate business. I think a lot about macro, you know, the, the real estate industry from a macro perspective. I find that really interesting. And we touched on that. And uh, we spoke about the agency business. And, um, you know, no, I, I can't really think of any questions that, that, you know, that you could have asked or things we could have uh, discussed, you know, other than to say, you know, for me, outsourcing has become a big part of my business. It's afforded me some freedoms that I wouldn't otherwise have. And I would encourage anyone who's listening or watching to think about how you apply that in your own life, in your own business, because technology is here to stay. You're either going to embrace it and kind of run with the pack or maybe even hopefully excel, or you're going to, you know, uh, Be that fine. you're going to try to, yeah, you're going to try to keep the technology at bay, in which case there's a good chance that your clients and your competitors are going to go flying by. So for those who are considering uh, ways to simplify, you know, their role in an organization or, uh, you know, maybe, maybe get that task off your plate that you really, really dislike, or that causes you incredible stress or pressure, you know, consider outsourcing and technology. You don't necessarily have to go out and hire somebody. I mean, there's ways to, you and I, for example, I scheduled on a, I think it was a Calendly calendar, Right. You know, if you were doing that yourself, that I'm sure that would cause you uh, a lot of stress and pressure. If you hired someone to do it, there'd be a big expense. And something as simple as a calendar has allowed you to avoid that, you know, that task. Or I mean, I'm sure it doesn't. It wouldn't excite you to to uh, go back you know, to take down your email. own appointments. So oh, hey, you know, I mean, that's yeah, yeah, that's something like that's like really simple, really minor. But you know. Uh, you know, just just one quick example. So that's all I would say is is just you know there's a lot of solutions out there, and as you begin to look around, you can find ways to to really improve um, or simplify things for the better. At least in my opinion. Awesome. Well, how can listeners contact you? The best way to reach us is um, so the name of the VA business is Real Estate Project Solutions. dot com is the website there um, specifically for lead gen and real estate calling reps. dot com. Uh, R E P S. Um, obviously, I'm I'm on Facebook and Instagram as well. But you can reach me through the site, or like I said, or on Facebook. And uh, either myself or someone from my team would be happy to, to reach out and engage with you. I try to make myself available uh, to people all the time. I love speaking to new people and and hearing about their business and uh, seeing how we can help solve some problems for them. So I find that fulfilling. But, but yeah, I would say social media or the website for sure. Awesome, Max Fish, everyone investor, wholesaler, VA extraordinaire. Really appreciate you being on today. Thanks, Max. It was my pleasure, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you want to accomplish your real estate goals, then I highly suggest downloading my free ultimate real estate goal setting framework. The link is in the description of the show and it will help you break down your annual income goal into the amount of phone calls, appointments, or open houses you need in order to achieve that goal. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.